Hello, my name is Dr. Omende, and we continue with our lecture series on um, blood supply to the central nervous system. We had covered blood supply to the cerebrum, so now we are discussing blood supply to the medulla. So remember the um, structures of the medulla. We said anteriorly you have pyramids followed by um, olives. Then between pyramid and olive, you have hypoglossal nerve. Then from all leaves, we say to have the um, um, the tuberculum, tuberculum cinereum containing the spinal tracts and nuclear trigeminal nerve. Then posteriorly, from the midline, you have fasciculus um, gracilis followed by fasciculus cuneatus, then the inferior cerebellar peduncles. So those are the external structures of the medulla when they ask you to describe. So now, anterior spinal arteries usually supply anterior medial structures, so structures that are anterior and medial aspects. So you have the pyramids, the medial longitudinal fasciculus, medial lemniscus, the solitary and um, vagal nuclei, as well as the hypoglossal nuclei. So you need to go back to the cross section of the medulla to check the structures that are anterior medially. They are supplied by anterior spinal arteries. Then posterior spinal arteries supply the structures posteriorly, so mainly fasciculus and nuclear gracilis and cuneatus. Then you have the posterior inferior cerebellar artery. They supply the retro olivary nuclei, the region, the region uh, posterior to the olivary nuclei. So that region is usually comprised of spinothalamic tract, the spinal trigeminal nucleus, hypothalamus spinal tract, as well as nucleus ambiguous. Then we have bulbar branches of vertebral artery that will supply the pyramids, the hypoglossal nuclear, as well as inferior olivary nuclear complex. So as you can see, this is the medulla. So around the, the pyramids, you have anterior spinal artery. Okay. Then you have medullary branches that can come from the basilar artery. That's your posterior inferior cerebellar artery, which are branches of um, um, vertebral and then anterior spinal arteries. Then venous supply of the medulla is basically by the basilar venous system and the inferior petrosal sinus as well as the occipital sinus. So you can appreciate the three vessels that supply the medulla towards the anterior medial aspect is anterior spinal followed by um, vertebral on the anterior lateral and then posteriorly the posterior inferior cerebellar artery supplies the medulla oblongata. So we have medial medullary syndrome. What is medial medullary syndrome? When there is occlusion of the medullary branch of anterior spinal artery or the bulbar branches of vertebral artery. So medullary branch of anterior spinal artery or bulbar branches of vertebral arteries. Remember anterior spinal artery is also a branch from vertebral artery. So what structures will be affected? Remember we said anterior spinal supplies the structures around the mid, uh, and, uh, ventral median fissure. So the structures affected will be the medial lemniscus. So there is loss of position and discriminative touch as well as vibration on the opposite side of the body. Then the pyramids will be involved. So there will be contralateral hemiparesis. Remember there is decussation of the pyramid. The lower portion, then hypoglossal, which is usually within the ventral lateral sulcus, hypoglossal nerve will be affected. Therefore, that gives you ipsilateral paralysis of the tongue. Why ipsilateral? Because hypoglossal nerve is lower motor neuron. There's no decussation. It's the upper motor neurons that are coming from the contralateral side. So in hypoglossal nerve, uh, you get ipsilateral paralysis of the tongue. So those are the features, clinical features of medial medullary syndrome. Mm -hmm loss of sensation of position and discriminatory touch and vibrations from the opposite side of the body. Why? Because at this level, we are having the medial lemniscus, the decussation of the um, dorsal column pathway. Then the pyramids being affected gives you contralateral hemiparesis because decussation occurs at a lower level, pyramidal decussation. And then you get ipsilateral paralysis of the tongue because of hypoglossal nerve involvement. Remember, it's around the ventrolateral sulcus, just after the, between the pyramids and the olives, and that region is supplied by anterior spinal artery. Then we have lateral medullary syndrome, which is also called the Wallenberg syndrome. And Wallenberg syndrome is caused by occlusion of posterior inferior cerebellar artery, which is a branch of vertebral. Posterior inferior cerebellar artery occlusion gives you lateral medullary syndrome. So what, is the, what are the clinical features? 
Remember, posterior inferior cerebellar is supplying the posterior aspect. Anterior spinal is supplying this portion. So, what are the features of lateral medullary syndrome? Spinal trigeminal tract and nucleus will be affected. So, there will be loss of pain and temperature sensation from the same side, ipsilateral side of the face. Spinal trigeminal tract and nucleus leading to loss of pain and temperature sensation on the ipsilateral side of the face. Remember, it's trigeminal that gives general sensation of the face. Then we have spinal lemniscus at that region. And if spinal lemniscus is affected, you lose pain and temperature sensation from the opposite side of the body. Spinal lemniscus contains the lateral spinothalamic tract. So, and it contains pain and temperature sensation from the opposite side of the body because the lateral spinothalamic tract, there is usually decussation at the spinal cord level. Yeah, the um, uh, first order will um, send information and the second order neurons decussate at the level of the spinal cord. So that's why the effect, loss of pain and temperature is at the opposite side of the body. Nuclear ambiguous will be affected, leading to ipsilateral paralysis of muscles of the palate. So swallowing and phonation will be affected. Then, because of hypothalamus spinal tracts around the same region supplied by Parker, uh, posterior inferior cerebellar artery, there will be honor syndrome. Remember, we said hypothalamus spinal tract contains uh, fibers from the hypothalamus coming to regulate the spinal cord section that affect uh, the, the that contains origin of sympathetic. So, what are the features of honor syndrome? We said meiosis because parasympathetic is acting unopposed, torsis because the levator palpebra superioris muscle becomes weakened because a small smooth muscle portion is supplied by sympathetic nerves and then anhydrosis where there's lack of sweating and there's usually also facial flushing then the inferior cerebellar peduncle and the vestibular nuclei can uh, are located in the region supplied by pica so when there is occlusion of this vessel there will be dizziness and cerebellar taxi as well as nystagmus nystagmus is oscillatory eyeball movement so again, it's this posterior portion that's supplied by pica leading to lateral medullary syndrome. So then blood supply to the pons, we talked of the pontine branches. We said you have the paramedian supplying the pons, the region around the, the, um, the basilla groove, then followed by short circumferential fibers, then the long circumferential fibers will extend towards the lateral aspect of the pons. What's a blood supply to the midbrain mostly is from branches of the basilar artery. So the posterior cerebral and the superior cerebellar, as well as posterior communicating and anterior choroidal that are coming from internal carotid artery. So we have what you call Weber syndrome. What is Weber syndrome? The basal portion of the midbrain, when it's not supplied by blood due to occlusion of the mesencephalic branch of posterior cerebral artery, terminal branch. So when there's occlusion of mesencephalic branch of posterior cerebral artery, you get Weber syndrome. So corticospinal tracts are within the midbrain. So if you occlude blood supply, you get contralateral hemiparesis. Remember, decussation will occur at the pyramids. That's why it's contralateral. Oculomotor nerve comes from the midbrain at the level of superior colliculi. So ipsilateral paralysis of ocular muscles, all of them except lateral rectus supplied by abducens and superior oblique supplied by trochlear nerve. Then you get lateral strabismus because lateral rectus is pulling the eye towards the lateral aspect. So then pupillary dilatation will occur because edinger westphal parasympathetic nuclei of the oculomotor will be affected if there's no blood supply to the midbrain. So sympathetic nerves will act un unopposed and sympathetic leads to dilatation of the pupil, which we call midriasis. Blood supply to the cerebellum, it's supplied by three vessels, superior cerebellar from the basilar artery, supplying the superior aspect of the cerebellum, cerebellar hemispheres, then you have anterior inferior cerebellar artery from the basilar artery, then you have the posterior inferior cerebellar artery from vertebral artery. So it supplies the posterior inferior aspect of the um, cerebellar hemispheres. Then blood supply to the spinal cord, you have two main arteries, 
the vertebral arteries, the right and left, usually give two posterior spinal arteries and one anterior spinal artery. So these are the main uh, sources of blood supply to the spinal cord, especially the superior aspect. So vertebral artery giving two posterior spinal and one anterior spinal artery. Then we also have radicular arteries. Radicular arteries are segmental arteries. Spinal cord being a longitudinal structure, passing through cervical, thoracic, lumbar regions. Each region where it passes, it gets uh, um, blood supply from vessels within that region. So the cervical portion of the spinal cord gets blood supply from vertebral artery, inferior thyroid, as well as ascending cervical artery. Inferior thyroid is from the thyrocervical trunk from first part of subclavian, and um, ascending um, cervical is also from subclavian artery. Then the thoracic region is supplied by posterior intercostal arteries, which come from thoracic aorta, while the lumbar region of the spinal cord is supplied by lumbar and sacral arteries from the abdominal aorta. So when you're asked about arterial blood supply of the spinal cord, um, the cervical region by vertebral artery and its branches, two posterior spinal and anterior spinal artery, as well as inferior thyroid from thyrocervical trunk of subclavian and ascending cervical from subclavian. Then thoracic region supplied by posterior intercostals from thoracic aorta and lumbar region supplied by lumbar and sacral arteries from abdominal aorta. So we've said it's a longitudinal structure and it will get segmental vessels depending on where it's coming from. So you can appreciate the cervical radicular branches from the costal cervical trunk, the thoracic from the intercostals, then you have the lumbar from lumbar vessels. Then we have what you call the great radicular artery, which is called uh, artery of Adam Kewis. So this just shows you the segmental blood supply to the spinal cord. Okay, again, the segmental blood supply, you can appreciate the radicular arteries. So we have the largest radicular artery, which is called the artery of Adam Kewis, or also called the artery of lumbar enlargement, is usually found between T12 and L2, and mostly on the left side. So you have to add this to arterial blood supply of the spinal cord. The great arterial uh, artery of Adam Kewis, which is artery of lumbar enlargement at T12 to L2, and mainly on the left side. Then the venous drainage of the spinal cord, again, we have the radicular veins and the longitudinal veins. So the longitudinal veins, these are the anterior and posterior spinal veins that correspond with anterior and posterior spinal arteries. And we also have the epidural venous plexus. Epidural means outside the, uh, the dura. These epidural venous plexuses are also called internal vertebral plexuses. So they are usually connected to thoracic, abdominal, and intercostal veins, and they are valveless. Valveless meaning the blood flow in them is not unidirectional. It can go whichever direction. So that way it predisposes this to spread of malignancy. So you can have prostate cancer, thyroid cancer, or breast cancer that can spread from these organs to the spinal cord because these epidural venous plexuses communicate with veins in the thorax, veins in the abdomen. And since they are valveless, they can carry metastasis from these visceral, these organs into the spinal cord. So this just shows you the epidural um, venous, sorry, this is your anterior spinal vein and this is your great radicular vein and you can appreciate the external venous plexus that will communicate with the epidural venous plexuses. So what's the applied anatomy? We have what you call spinal shock. This is just a transient period where you lose function of the spinal cord after injury. And usually it's, uh, it results to immediate depression of all reflex activities that are below the uh, lesion of the spinal cord. So the bowel and bladder reflexes will stop, blood pressure will reduce, the muscles below the injury get paralyzed and insensitive. And after that, neurofunction may return within a few hours following the injury. And if function does not resume within 48 hours, paralysis may be absent. So spinal shock is just transient functional loss. And within 48 hours, ideally the neural function should return. But if it fails, then paralysis will occur. Thank you very much.